waiting for Janice to get to the piano. Good evening, everyone. Turn your hymn books to song number 364. Song number 364. You can thank Janice for standing on the promises, and you can't sit down when you sing that song. So everyone, join me in standing. First, second, and the last. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. On verse number two. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the hell is torn to doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Pray for us as we open our service. Amen. You may be seated. Turn your songbooks to number 343. Revive us again. First, third, and the last. preacher here needs to learn that in this church we're southern we sing amen we live in pennsylvania amen we, we this is a southern church we sing amen 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 <laughs> verse number three sing it out Fifteen, three, fifteen. Sing the first and last. If I could remember the title of the song. Three, fifteen. Of take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. 
Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of thy love. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. Thank you. We have a special request that Emmy play her trumpet again tonight. Carolyn didn't get to hear it this morning. Peter didn't get to hear it this morning. And so Emmy's going to come play for her sister Taylor again. Taylor's leaving us Thursday, so everybody be sure and give her a big hug and tell her we'll be praying for her. I reminded her not to go out drinking when she gets back in college. She's been dry all summer. <laughs> no, I don't think Taylor's that kind of girl. I would hope not. But we will miss her. And... and um, Emmy, you playing something different tonight? Oh, good. Let her rip, girl. Let me share this prayer request with you again. Don't forget to pray for Sharon and the kids. It's coming Wednesday so that they um, will be placed properly. Uh, Sharon's trying to get them placed with her, and if the uh, judge uh, doesn't make a decision, they'll have to go back with the other folks and, and then wait for the adoption to go through and become final and all that stuff. How about a testimony or two tonight? We have another special? No, we can do another special. Come on. We're, we're flexible around here. You were ratted out. <laughs> Be thinking of a testimony, though. Keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back. 
now testimonies. Who has one? Brittany? Oh, sister had a baby. How much longer? We got to listen to this now. <laughs> okay. Sister had a baby. Mm hmm. Nice, nice French name, right? Dominic Van Michael Roman. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Gilbert. Yeah, he did a great job. Danny's back again tonight, glutton for punishment. Uh, we had a great vacation Bible school. I appreciate everything everybody did to make it that way. It was a good one. Patrick. It opens the door, gets us in the home. By the name there, by the way, their names were Danny and Wendy. If you want to be praying for them this week, we're glad to have them. Michael. Amen. Anybody else? Kathleen. Amen. Have some friends, uh, handicrafters that you eat lunch with, and they're Christians too, right? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's great. Gets to pray for the meal at handicrafters. That's being a testimony on the job. Imagine that. Unusual thought. Anybody else? Rich? The teens and almost teens, like Josh and Taylor, you're still a teen, aren't you? Well, yeah, and Taylor and Emmy and Becky, they, they all jumped right in and helped Gabby when he was here. And Gary was here and set up, had a lot of help. That's, that's a great thing. Anybody else? Barbara? Amen. Until he fell off the wall yesterday and banged his head and got a concussion. And Oh, no, that was Butch. That wasn't you. All right. Take your Bibles and look with me in Colossians chapter 2 tonight. We, we have mentioned recently a lot about what a horrible world we're uh, having to survive in. And I hope that we get beyond that, that idea of just surviving and getting through uh, this is what we call life. I'm, I'm doing more than just waiting to die. I hope you're doing more than just waiting to die. Uh, God has much more in store for us than just having us waiting to die. What, what are your plans and your future? What does it hold? I'm going to make some assumptions tonight. I'm going to assume that I'm speaking primarily to Christians. I doubt that there's anyone in the room that has not made a, a profession of faith already. And I'm also assuming that uh, if you are a Christian, that you really want to serve the Lord, that you want to be a better Christian tomorrow than you were today and a better Christian the next day than you were uh, today. And yet we sometimes forget that the time that we have left is just rapidly passing us. Um, the older you get, and I know that, that I never believed it when I was Emmy's age or Becky's age or Josh's age or uh, uh, Taylor's age or even 
uh, Pastor Pete's age, uh, that time seems to move more rapidly, but it really does. The older you get, the more it seems like that the years are just clicking by very rapidly, and we don't have time to waste. And how do we keep from wasting that time is made, the, the difference is made between wasting and being successful in that time by the decisions we make. And the, the sad thing is there's so many voices in the world that are begging for us to listen to them. How many of you watched the uh, Republican debate the other night when you got home from vacation Bible school? Wasn't it a weird thing? I mean, uh, first off, they had 10 people, I think, in the first round, or vice versa, in 7 or 8 or 10 or something in the second round, and that was kind of crazy. Uh, but then the, the answers and the people and getting into it and Rand Paul jumping on Trump and Trump jumping on everybody, including the moderator, telling that poor girl uh, she was having her monthly. That's why she was so hard on him and all that kind of stuff. It was just crazy. They wanted us to listen to them because they want us to hear their message. They want us to vote for them. And that's a, an illustration of what the entire society is to the Christian. The entire society is screaming at us, trying to get our attention and take our attention away from the Lord, and there's some things that we can do to keep that from happening. Uh, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Colossians and read down through verse 10. Uh, we're not going to use all of this, but I want to get the whole backdrop of it. Paul says, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. That would include us. We've not seen the Apostle Paul's face in the flesh. Verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's laying this groundwork for a church that, just like our church, has a world out there bantering for us to listen to their philosophy and listen to their ideas and listen to their uh, desires for the church instead of doing what God wants us to do. When we talk any more about churches, you have to be very careful that you're not talking about, uh, that, that you understand we're not talking about all the same type of churches. There are churches that change their personnel and their programs at the drop of a hat simply because they're seeking something new. Uh, the new program comes along and they'll ditch everything in the process and they'll spend money on a new program or a new personality comes along and they'll fire their preacher and they'll put in a new preacher because he's younger, he's older, he's more uh, loud, he's quieter for whatever reason. Uh, a new preacher is going to make the difference. And so all these things are done because man has a way of looking for something new, thinking that there's something better than what they already have. Well, read with me. Let's read it together, verse 3. Ready? Read. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What better thing can you have than to have God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God? When the Bible says you have all the treasure of knowledge and wisdom rolled up in that package. If we would listen to them alone, we would not have the problems we're having in our society today, and our churches wouldn't have the problems that they're having. Even good churches have the, the temptation to trade in what has worked for years for something that's new and something that's different. Uh, somebody asked me not long ago when I was telling them about our vacation Bible school and what we were going to do, they said, well, you've done that so long. When are you going to do something new? And my answer to them was very plain. When this stops working when kids don't like being cowboys anymore, when kids and boys and girls won't come and listen to the gospel plain and simple and hear the gospel presented and trust Christ as their Savior, then maybe we'll look for a different type of program. But the truth is there are vacation Bible school companies that spend an entire year putting together programs to sell to people and then next year want to sell them another program for a different type of vacation Bible school. What, what is the purpose in that? I didn't see our kids all disappointed doing all those old silly games out there, uh, going through that obstacle course out there, uh, doing the sack races out there, dunking Peter in a dunk tank. That's so old. I mean, that's just boring. And uh, riding the horses, that's just boring. And listen, as long as it works, why do we have to change it? 
I think God needs wants us to understand that that need to change is a fleshly need, not a spiritual need. Why are people buying new versions of the Bible every year? Because the flesh says it's going to be better than the old one. You don't improve on perfection. How do you improve on the gospel message? You can't. How do you improve on what God has already done in the past? You can't. He does things perfect. So in order to keep that from happening in verse 4, Paul begins to give some advice. He says, This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Somebody tell me what that word beguile means. Barbara. <laughs> it means to fool or to deceive someone, doesn't it? It's a deceptive type word. It's the same word that goes in along with the next word that he uses there, beguile you with enticing words. That word enticing means to seduce. Uh, when certain people go to certain uh, refreshment companies and buy certain things to drink, sometimes they are enticed by young ladies who give them free coffee and, and they, they, they don't know how to respond exactly. But the truth is, enticing words come from Satan. Seductive words come from Satan. Beguiling words come from Satan and the flesh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They don't come from God. God does not deceive you. God doesn't entice you. God doesn't beguile you. God tells you the truth, and he says you're stupid if you don't believe the truth. Basically, that's what he said. He said in the Old Testament, it's never changed. I set before you a choice today. You obey, you get a blessing. You disobey, you get a cursing. And it's never changed. He doesn't change that. And so Satan comes in and he tries to beguile and to tempt and to seduce people away from there. And then in verse 5, he says, though, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. In verse 6 is where we're going to start. He says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. This is the first step into making good choices. It's the commandment of faith. If I went down a litany test tonight, I could tell you that when we got saved, we had to accept the virgin birth. And everybody in this room would agree with that. No virgin birth, no salvation. I could tell you we, could, we have to accept the holy life of Jesus. If he sinned, no Savior. We have to accept that. Everybody would agree with that. I could say we have to believe that he died on the cross, died completely, and was buried in a tomb. And you don't believe that? There's no salvation. You can't get around it. We would accept that. It's a fundamental of the faith. I would say to you that we believe in the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of the Lord. And we would say we agree with that. How did we, how did we come to believe in all of those things? I didn't see Jesus die on the cross. I didn't see him buried in that tomb. I didn't see him resurrected that third day. I believe by what? For by grace are you saved through? By faith we accept those things. Everybody in this room probably agrees with those fundamentals that I just mentioned to you. Here's where the problem starts. Faith doesn't end when you get saved. What's Paul say here? He says, as you have therefore received the Lord Jesus... Uh, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did we receive him? By faith. How are we to walk day by day? By faith. You got saved by placing your faith in the finished work of Christ. All of those fundamentals rolled together in that package. The finished work of Jesus. That's how you got saved. Well, what happened? Now do we trust Christ by faith for every decision of our life, every day of our lives? And the answer has to be a resounding no, most Christians don't. Most Christians don't get up in the morning and say, Now, Lord, today's another day that I have to live for you. I have to go work the job today. That puts food on the table. But, Lord, if you'll show me the way while I'm at work today, I'm going to be a testimony witness for you. I really want to do that, Lord, if you'll help me do that. And, Lord, I have a decision to make about how to handle that guy at work that's not doing his job right, and I have to take care of that. And, Lord, you know the boss isn't very nice to me all of a sudden. Lord, I really need help with it. Most Christians do not even consider how Christ works into your everyday life. We don't walk by faith. We walk by sight. We get up in the morning. We shave. We, uh, sometimes some, some people work out. Uh, we get dressed. We go off. We stop by Starbucks and get a cup of coffee. Or in my case, sometimes McDonald's and get a cup of coffee. I can't 
stand Starbucks coffee and it's a whole lot more expensive. Uh, by the way, uh, senior coffee at McDonald's are still a dollar. I don't know what they are at, McDo at uh, Starbucks. But, uh, and by the way, I found out I can make my own uh, caramel coffee at home. I got home one afternoon, had some coffee left in the pot. I thought, I'm going to try this. I put it in a cup, put a little sugar in it, poured uh, some coffee in on top of it, and poured ice in on top of it, put caramel uh, flavoring in on top of it. Sir, it was as good as McDonald's, if not better. It cost a whole lot less, too. That's a byproduct of the message. Anyway, we don't put Christ in the center of our everyday walk. We don't consider how he wants us to live our everyday walk. He says here, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Now listen, what's he saying here? There, there's a, a word there that's a compound word, therefore. I mentioned it this morning with a wherefore and the therefore. They both mean the same thing when you see them in scripture. You have to back up. And one of the reason you have to back up is because it's building on what came before. We need to learn to walk in faith. Why? Because the world, the flesh, and the devil is beguiling us and seducing us, enticing us to walk in the, in the flesh. We need to walk in the spirit. We need to walk not by sight but by faith. And when the world, the flesh, and the devil is so enticing and seducing and beguiling us, and, and can I tell you this? Don't sit there and say to yourself, Satan doesn't ever deceive me. Don't sit there and say to yourself, Satan can't seduce me. He can't convince me of something wrong. You are fooling yourself if you think that. You have a flesh, and that flesh is liable to be tempted above that you've ever thought about. You are liable to be seduced by Satan. And so Paul puts the therefore, and he says the, the way you're going to counteract that is to receive as you've received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk in him. Now, how would that change your daily activities? Suddenly, the Lord's going to have a say in what you choose that day. You have a right to make any choice you want. You don't have a right to get around the consequences that comes with that choice. Uh, I have a right to lay my hand on this pulpit. And I have a right to take this book and smash my hand if I want to. But guess what? I don't have a right. I don't have a right to smash my hand with this book and say, well, then why is my hand hurting? Well, of course it's going to hurt. I made a stupid decision. Young people, listen to me. You have a choice to make, but you can't change the consequences once you make that choice. And sometimes there are life-altering and long-lasting consequences to choices you make when you're not walking in the spirit and not walking by faith, but you're walking in the flesh. So he tells us here, it's time for us to trust him in our daily walk. The second thing he mentions, he says here uh, in verse 7, he says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Not only do you have the command of faith, we need to walk by faith, but we also have this commitment to becoming firm, becoming steadfast. I like the words he uses here. He uses the word rooted. What, what does the term rooted mean to you when you think about it? A plant. You know, I had a tree some years back after Ivan came up the East Coast, and we didn't get a lot of Ivan. But I was sitting in my living room, and all of a sudden I heard something that shook the whole house. And when I jumped up, all I could see out the front of the house was tree. We had a huge, huge tree that had fallen over and hit the house. You know what caused that tree to fall over and hit the house? The roots weren't down deep. I don't know why. It was an oak tree, and it was an old oak tree. But it had a very surface root system. And when that tree started to go, it just pulled up a little bit of a ball wasn't much dirt hanging off the bottom of the side of those roots when that tree fell over. That root system wasn't deep. Now, when a tree has a tap root or gets those roots down in the ground, it's going to withstand when the hard times come. When Satan throws his worst at you, you'll be able to stand. When you're rooted, look what else he says here. Rooted and built up in him. Built up. Now, Marshall, you're a contractor. Suppose somebody calls you tomorrow and they say, I want you to build an addition onto my house. And you go out and you look at it and the guy says, well, I really got to cut cost with this, so I don't want any footers, Doug. We're not going to bother with any foundation. I just want you to build it like you build a shed and just set it right on the ground. How, how are you going to think about that? 
Never stand behind it, and the government won't even let you do that. You have to build it right according to code. Jesus said when you build a house, you go down to bedrock. You put that footer down. You don't build on sand. You don't build on a shifting foundation. You want some stability there. Here's the problem with Christians. Many times we don't have that foundation because we think we're too far above being taught. Well, I went to Sunday school when I was a kid, but yeah, you weren't saved then maybe, but you went to Sunday school, you didn't understand it, you heard the stories in mythological storybook form like Adam and Eve and Noah and Moses and Abraham and Daniel and the lions. Then you heard all the stories, but the Holy Spirit couldn't speak to you because you hadn't trusted Christ as your Savior. You need the strength and that stability from that foundation. When a, a person gets saved, it does not matter how old they are. They need to put that foundation down. Now, what's the foundation that I just mentioned to you? The fundamentals of the faith. Are you sure you believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, hey, that never happened before. Not the way that happened. Lazarus came back, and he raised a couple other, three other people while he was on earth. But people don't just come back from the dead like he did on his own and never die again. It just doesn't work. Well, it did. Do you believe Mary conceived the baby Jesus without a father, a human instrument? Yeah, I do. Well, it never happened before, and it never happened since. Well, if you're convinced of those things, you're convinced that puts that foundation down. And let me say this to you, and I know some people get tired of me harping on this. If you don't have a foundation that this is the Word of God, you don't have a foundation, period. If you believe the Bible is a book just like any other book that somebody has the right to tear it apart, take verses out, change verses, delete verses, delete words, then you don't have anything that's stead rock or bedrock and sure, steadfast for you to have a foundation to build on. How could you build on something that somebody's changed all through the years? How could you build on something that, you know, if, if there's a crack in a foundation, there's a problem. And you start taking words out of the Bible, you're going to have a crack in the foundation. You start taking verses out of the Bible, you're going to have a crack in the foundation. Do you believe this is the Word of God? Now, before you say, well, of course I believe. If you believe it, do you put it into practice, even if you don't like what it says? And then I could park here, and I could talk about women being in submission to their own husbands. And I could park here and talk about men loving their wives as Christ loved the church. We could talk about modest apparel. We could go a lot of different directions. But do you take the word of God and obey it because it says it and that settles it? If you have that foundation, Satan's deceptive words are not going to sway you. That building, build up, layer upon layer. You don't jump from the ground up when you're building a house. You start with that foundation. On that foundation, you lay blocks. I'm assuming they still do it this way, don't they, Marshall? If I get it out of order, get, get to me, all right? You put blocks down, and you come up from the foundation with blocks. Then on the top of the block, you put a, a sill plate, and then you put your walls up onto the sill plate and the floor joists on the sill plate and then the walls up. You don't just start with a foundation and start putting shingles on the house. Nothing there to hold them up. You have to build. You know, the Bible talks about learning the word of God line upon line, precept upon precept. You know what that takes? It takes some time in studying and reading and thinking about what God has said. If you read your Bible and you believe it, like we've already talked about, then you read it and it doesn't, doesn't uh, it, it says something that maybe you don't like or you don't want to follow, and you think it through and you pray it through and it says what it says, and then finally you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to do what you say. That's when you start building line upon line, precept upon precept. If you're going to not obey the word of God, it's not going to be real to you. It's not even going to be clear to you. If you're starting out with disobedience, how do you do it with your, with your children? Now, I don't know how you are, but if I tell one of my children I want them to do something and they disobey me, I kind of slack off on telling them a lot more things that I want them to do if they're not going to do the first one I told them. Why waste my breath? And don't you think that's the way God deals with his children? If you're not going to be in obedience to what you know about the Word of God, He's not going to keep strengthening you with it. You have to obey it. Obedience, the Bible says, is better than sacrifice. We need to learn to obey what it says. So we're built up in it. Somebody said, Ironside said this. He said, Scripture nowhere condemns the acquisition of knowledge. It is wisdom of this world 
not its knowledge, that is foolishness with God. Philosophy is but worldly wisdom. It is the effort of human mind to solve the mystery of the universe, and it is not an exact science, for the philosophers have never been able to come to any satisfactory conclusion as to the why or the wherefore of stuff, things. I ran across this this afternoon. Remember I talked this morning in Sunday school, for those of you who are in here, about faith healing and faith healers. Somebody put on Facebook this afternoon, the reason you don't hear about faith healers going to hospital rooms and clearing out hospitals with their ability to hear is the same reason you don't hear about psychics winning the lottery. I never thought of that. You're a psychic, oh, what's the lottery numbers for tomorrow? Now, I don't play the lottery myself. If you do, you're foolish, but uh, I don't, don't get involved with that stuff. But they don't win the lottery. God gives us the answers. Now, I want you to see in verse 8 what it says here. There's this warning against the foolishness of this world. It says here, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and not after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Uh, we have a, a good friend who went through college, got a degree and then a master's degree, and she took a course, guess what the course was, in a Christian college? Philosophy. And I asked her, I said, what in the world are you going to use a course in philosophy for and a degree in philosophy? You know what she told me? To teach philosophy. Can I ask you a question? Who cares what Aristotle thought? Who cares? Who cares what Socrates thought? All they have is human knowledge that's, that is contaminated by the flesh and sin. All they have is the knowledge that they can gain by looking and trying to understand the physical things of the world and not understand where it came from, who created it, where it's going, what's going to happen, and what's happening in the process. All they have are theories. All they have are ideas. I tell folks sometimes I can, I can read your thoughts. Rich, I can tell you what you're thinking right now. Thoughts. I can tell you what you're going to say next. Glory, I can tell you what you're going to say next. Next thing out of your mouth, guess what it's going to be? Words. That's philosophy. I just look at people and I see what they do when they're thinking. They're thinking thoughts. When they're speaking, they're speaking words. That's, isn't that deep? Well, listen, that's kind of silly, isn't it? And yet that's exactly what we do when we study the philosophy of this world. Nitsky, Nitsch, is that his name? Nit, Nitsch, who? Yeah, he was a philosopher, a religious philosopher. Who cares what he thought? What, what did it say here in verse 3? In whom are hid all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. You have at your disposal something that the great philosophers of the world cannot understand, and that you have the knowledge of the one who created the world. You have a knowledge of the God, the holy God of the universe, the creator, all-powerful God of the universe. And we understand what he wants us to know from this book. And what does philosophy do? I've got a degree in philosophy. Well, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to teach philosophy. Well, what are they going to do with it? Well, I guess they're going to do anything. We had a philosophy class in the, in the Bible college, my first year of Bible college. I hated it. I hated it because my Bible says no, don't let that stuff interfere with the truth of God's word. So why study it? Well, you got to know what they have to say. No, you don't. Anybody ever wonder why when you go to a bank and you lay $1,500 bills out on the counter, they never take a black pen and check them to see if they're real? You go to Walmart, lay a $5 bill on the counter, a girl pulling out a pen, checking to see if it's a real thing. Well, why don't they study fake money at the banks? They don't have to because they've got the real stuff. They know the truth. They know what's real because that's all they handle all day long. They don't have to be taught. They don't have to look at a pen. That's the way it is with God's word and the truth of God. We don't need to know what everybody in the world thinks. Now, I've, I've taught some classes at times about false religions because sometimes it helps you to understand where you need to go when the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons or somebody comes to your door. But in reality, we've got the truth. 
As far as getting through life, I don't need to know everything that the Catholics believe or don't need to know everything the Mormons believe or the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Seventh-day Adventists or any other cult, the Moonies or the Harry Krishnas or any of them. I don't need to know everything they believe because I have the truth. Why can't we get to the point where our faith is grounded in this word? It's foolishness to think that we need anything else. Now take that first word of verse 8. Take your pen or your highlighter and draw a circle around it. Why do you think I want you to draw a circle around it or highlight it or underline it? Because it's a warning. It's a warning. God says, thin ice. God is saying, bridge out ahead. God's saying, danger ahead. God's saying, danger ahead could harm you, don't go this direction, stop, it's a warning. God says through the Apostle Paul, beware lest any man spoil you. Well, what's the idea of that spoil? Well, we sometimes talk about the spoils of a war. When one army would come into a country and overthrow that country, all the stuff in that uh, country would suddenly become theirs. All the cattle would be theirs. All the gold would be theirs. All the crops would be theirs. Everything belonged to them because unto the victor goes the spoils. But this word actually has a connotation of going beyond that. It has the connotation of carrying away captive prisoners. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of seeing Christians being carried away by the enemy. Do they lose their salvation? No, not if they were saved. But I'm telling you, he can carry them away into his camp for a long time and make them miserable and make their testimony go to pot, not literally pot like folk, uh, folk smoke, all that. That could, that could be part of it. But he ruins their life and ruins their testimony till they get back in fellowship with God. Don't let that happen. God's saying beware. Don't let somebody spoil you. Don't let somebody take you captive. Don't let somebody spoil you through the philosophy, that, that love and pursuit of wisdom that is empty. Don't let somebody fool you through vain deceit. Well, what is vain deceit? The word vain means empty or worthless. The word deceit means delusional. Somebody's going to change you. Somebody's going to give you some delusion to believe rather than the truth. And then he says there, um, uh, verse 8, let me get to where I'm at. After the tradition of men. Okay, now, I'm going to throw you a real, a real curve here. How much of what churches do, even good churches anymore, is tradition? How does our service run at Safe Harbor Baptist Church? Sunday morning, I get up and say, hi, y'all, glad you're here. Turn the page. We turn, we sing a song. Then what do we do? Open with prayer. I'm down there. We lead the choir. And then what do we have? Meet and greet. While we're meeting and greeting, I come back up here. I get a bulletin out. I said, okay, open your bulletin. We do the, do the announcements. Then what do we do? No song. And then what do we do? Take the offering. That's an important part. And then what do we do? Sing another song. And then what do we do? Have a special. And then what do we do? I put you all to sleep with my message. Right? Well, the truth is this. That's all tradition. That that form of service, that, that traditional form of service that we use here. If we wanted to change that up somewhat and sing three songs before we have the special or have the special first or not have the choir sing or have the choir sing twice or have the choir sing during the offertory instead of where we have them, none of that would make any difference. That's tradition. Can I tell you a secret? I've known people leave the church because things like that weren't like they always were. We've never done it that way before. And I don't like it that way. So I'm leaving the church. Well, why would you leave the church over something about the order of service? If I got up and preached Jesus wasn't the Son of God, then leave the church. If I got up and preached that there's salvation in any other way, uh, other people or other ways of salvation other than Jesus, then leave the church. But why would we leave the church over a tradition? And can I tell you this? Why would people stay in a church over tradition? 
I could take you to churches within 50 miles of here and show you church after church where they've gone away from the deity of Christ and gone away from the virgin birth and gone away from the word of God. And good people stay in that church. You want to know why? My grandma went to this church. My mom and dad went to this church. I was raised in this church. I ain't ever leaving this church. Well, if it's not doing right and you stay in it, you're a party of that evil doing. Get out of that church. Go to a place where the gospel's preached and the Lord's loved and he's exalted and lifted up. The traditions of men send people to hell. Now, I want you to understand this. The Catholic church is full of tradition. The Mormon church is full of tradition, baptism for the dead and all the other stuff. There's all the cults are full, filled with tradition. We don't need to be held down by tradition. We need to be held down by the truth of God's word. And then he says there, that we are, that they are not after the rudiments of the world. What's that word rudiments mean there? That means the fundamental, the, the absolute basic and primary principles of anything. Can I tell you this? Homosexual marriage is not after the rudiments of the earth. I got a bumper sticker that I put on the back window of my car out there that says, uh, my definition of marriage has not changed, and it's signed God. The person who established marriage has the right to change the definition of a marriage, and God's never changed it. Men think they're going to change it. And when they change it, they're going away from what the established definition has been through the ages since men have been on the face of the earth. If you would care to check it, you can go to a library and you can pull up the laws in most every state in the union and you can find that up until the late 80s and mid 80s and 90s that homosexuality was against the law. Not just something that was taboo, it was against the law in most every state in the union. But now man says, well, we're going to do it our way. They're not doing what's right by the established facts of anything. You can go through the, the whole thing about uh, creations the same way and evolution the same thing. So we need to avoid that foolishness, not get into that, because the world and the world system is against God. It is against Christ. It is against you as a Christian. Then look in verse 9. He says, For in him... Why do we not have to get involved with all of that incompleteness and lying and delusional stuff? For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The very answer to everything that has ever been is found in Christ. You say, that's a pretty broad statement, Brother Gary. Well, it's true. Jesus says in Revelations, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You read the book of Genesis. You know what the word Genesis means other than Pastor Pete? I think I had him in Old Testament survey. He should know that. But what's the word Genesis mean? The beginnings. And in the book of Genesis, you find the beginnings of almost everything, and God established the beginnings of everything. He was there when it started. And so we have in Christ fullness of everything. In the, in the Godhead, we have fullness of everything. And then he tells us here that we're complete. If, if we're uh, recognizing what we have in Christ, we don't need all this other stuff in verse 10. And you're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Uh, I didn't bring this out in Sunday school this morning. I meant to and forgot it. Well, we were studying the gifts of the Spirit in Sunday school. The Bible study I teach down in Rising Sun is not just Baptist. We've never, I don't preach Baptist doctrine. I preach the Bible. I don't try to make people Baptist. I do preach salvation, and some have gotten saved in, in the, through the years in the process. But I, I have people down there every once in a while that are from a Pentecostal persuasion, a charismatic persuasion. And I've had more than one tell me this. Brother Gary, you preach a great message. All you need now is to fill in the Holy Spirit. You need to learn to speak in tongues. Now, I could throw a fit with them, you know, and argue with them for 20 minutes or so in an hour and still not change their mind because they know what they believe. But I simply tell them, well, you know, God gave me the Holy Spirit, and he got, got all that I could get of him the day I got saved because he's a person. But if he wants to give me more gifts than I'm already experiencing, I'm more than ready to have them. 
And I leave it at that. Why? I'm complete in Christ. I do not believe in speaking in tongues. But I'll tell you this. If I was out on visitation or out in another uh, country somewhere and had an opportunity to witness to somebody and they couldn't speak English, if, or uh, couldn't speak English, and let's say I was back in the Ukraine, I couldn't speak uh, the language of the Ukraines, which is not Russian, by the way, Pete. It's a, it's a Ukraine dialect. Uh, they don't like the Russian language in the Ukraine. And I couldn't speak it. If God gave me the ability to speak Ukraine for five minutes to lead somebody to the Lord, do you think I'd turn that down? Of course not. Could he do that? Of course he could. Is he going to do it? Well, I don't know. He might. He might not. But I have never seen any reason to learn to speak. What I just do, I spoke in tongues. I told him in Sunday school this morning. You'll remember this, Carolyn. Dr. R.E. Williams told me and told our church publicly that he went to a charismatic church for a lot of his years when he was growing up, and they had classes learning to speak in tongues where they would teach them how to say the syllables and the monosyllables over and over and speak in what they called tongues. Hey, God doesn't, doesn't play that game. If somebody needs to be saved and he, he wants to use it that way, I don't care. I'm not going to argue with him. If he does, I'll just go ahead and talk because I won't know I'm speaking in a tongue. I'll just think I'm talking in English and telling them about Jesus. But if they're hearing in their language, that'd be fine by me. I don't care. But listen, I'm complete in Christ. What do you need? Uh, can I tell you this is the secret of marriage? You're looking at me like, how are you going to tie this into marriage? Hey, when you're complete with your completer, your help meet is your completer, and you're complete with that person you're married to, your eyes don't wander wanting something else. You've got all you will ever need. I think it was Randy Travis sang a song. And see if I can get the words. Something about I'm going to love you forever and ever, amen. And it talks about when you get old, you start forgetting things. And he says it's already proven true for him because when he met that girl he was singing about, he had forgotten every woman but her. When you're complete with your spouse, you don't go looking for something else. You have all you need right there. That's the way we are with Christ. We're his bride. We are complete in him. Don't let, uh, Taylor, when you go to school, you're going to have people give you some strange philosophies and ideas. You probably already have heard them, haven't you? Yeah, and don't believe them. You don't need something new because this book tells you we have everything that we will ever need to know from God. Through Christ, he's the Godhead, the embodiment of the Godhead in Christ. We're complete in him. So how are we going to do, get away and get around listening to every voice that comes upon us? We're going to stay true to the word of God. Now, for some of us, that means we, gotta, we have to start studying the Bible more. We have to be in church more. We have to pray more. We have to look to see what God says. We need to give him room every morning in our lives to run our day, seeking to walk by faith every day, everything you do. Lord, which way should I go to work this morning? Most of us have our own set patterns about the way we go to work every day. What gas station should I get gas in today, Lord? You know, if you started praying and being that conscious of God working in your life, he may open up more, more uh, avenues for you to tell people about Jesus. It may be somebody brand new you've never met in your life, and you begin to, to talk to them, and suddenly the door opens, and you can tell them about the Lord. Lord, what is it that you want for me to do today? I don't need to follow the world. They don't have anything new. All they've got is all the rehashed philosophies through the ages that haven't worked, but I have freshness and life in you. I can walk with the Lord and not listen to every voice from the crowd and from the world that's trying to get me to follow them. Proverbs says, let me read it to you. I've got it written down here and just didn't read it. Proverbs says in Proverbs chapter 24, and verse 6, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. You know what? I've got 40 plus men in this book that wrote the word of God. 66 books. I don't remember now how many chapters. Pete, how many chapters? A lot of chapters and a lot of verses. Multitude of counselors for safety. Just make sure that you're following the right counselors and not everybody out in the world. 
Father, thank you that we can have this time tonight to look into the book of Colossians and to be encouraged about standing firm and growing and being all you want us to be every day of our lives, walking by faith. And I pray that you'd help us to apply this tonight. And Lord, as we go over and have this uh, fellowship next door with the tomato sandwiches, I pray that it'd be a blessing and the fellowship would be sweet. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's go next door and eat a mater sandwich. <laughs>